All right, everyone. Welcome back to another Coyote Radio Show and Podcast. Yep. We, we got a great guest today. Been on the show before, and it was a very long interview. We covered so much, so many topics, so, and a lot of that is still relevant today. So if you go back and kind of pick that apart, there's still a lot there. So, but Benjamin Todd's back with us. Yep, good to be here. You need a, a long sleeve shirt, apparently, to be in Indiana in the summertime. <laughs> it actually has cooled off quite a bit. We're chilling by the fire, and um, we had dinner earlier, and the weather's great. So we're just going to talk about this new record. Well, two records. And if, uh, if you follow the show, I've rant and raved about it before, because I have heard snippets that you've sent me. Yeah, I got them both tonight, too. We can listen to it. Oh, great. Afterward. So I've heard. Not you. Not y'all. That's all secret. Top top secret. Yes. But just those, like, not polished honky-tonk stuff that you cut. I had goosebumps just because of, like, what I know, what you, I think you're capable of doing, but what also what the public thinks you should be doing is two different. Yep. And I think <laughs> this one's really going to, I think it's just even going to grow um, people's appreciation for your musicianship and and your understanding of music and writing because your writing style some people say could, could only fit in one lane but that is not true and people are definitely going to find out with that yeah this album a working in the studio uh at the bomb shelter in nashville uh andrea produced both albums but most heavily i think produced the honky tonk record um, opened up a creative outlet for me that I really didn't know I had. Uh, the range of my voice, I got a lot of the lower range. Um, I got a lot more control uh, in my voice, the general capability that I didn't know that I had. Hey, no, no, no. Henry's with us too. Hey, no, <laughs> no. Good boy. But uh, it really opened up a lot of creative fluid uh, through my veins. And um, John James had a big part in that. Uh, he's in the Deslons and uh, plays with quite a few outfits and runs with Andrea a lot. And he did, he made just about half or three quarters of the signature licks from uh, the Telecaster and slide guitar and mandolin uh on those albums and did an incredible job but it was a, a spiritual experience and I'm, I'm really happy that i did the honky tonk album before the lost dog album the honky tonk album was just me in the studio with a group of nashville cats um we we had just legends people who had played with elvis presley and billy joe shaver and george jones um in the studio and it really helped me understand the process because i'd never recorded like that it was all uh live take and then uh sort of you know screwing and nailing things down uh so you know i was in an isolation room and then the majority of the band was in one room and then uh, i think piano player cut live tracks in another isolation room for that record but um, had I done the Lost Dog record first, uh, I would have not really understood the process. And in general, to be completely honest, uh, during the Hawking Talk record, I kind of mourned the death of Lost Dog. Really? I had decided in my mind, I, well, I've been going through a spiritual, huge spiritual awakening and, and, and processing a lot of my past, I'm kind of at the point in recovery where I'm putting back together the formulations of a normal life and trying to figure out what direction I want to go like as, as, a, as an individual. Um, and a part of that, uh, in the middle of the Honky Tonk record, I was like, I'm done. Really? I don't think, I don't think Lost Dog is going to make it. Um, and then ironically, we cut 12 tracks for the Honky Tonk record, and two of them just didn't fit. We were kind of, we were 
well, not we, me, was on the, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, all these people helping. No, 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 no one's making final decisions uh, for anything but me, uh, unfortunately or fortunately. But uh, two of them just didn't fit the honky tonk record. They were they were more Americana. They were more personal. They were more poetic. They didn't fit uh, the aesthetic. And I had recorded a split for Lost Dog that was two two tracks as well. That I ended up just I I just didn't like the takes. Um, I, I, and I, I just had to can them inevitably. I mean, it was like six or eight months Ooh. I worked on them. And, that, and that's a part of the process. Anyone who does any type of craft knows that feeling where you, I'm sure you do with taxidermy. You put fucking months into something and then you just you, <laughs> you fucking throw it in the fire. Um, so like a- after that album, a few weeks, like I had four songs and, uh, then I had three others that I was like, this could all totally work. And originally with the Lost Dog record, we were going to, at the very onset of the Lost Dog record, before I figured out all those four and those three, we were actually going to revamp a bunch of the old stuff. Kind of like, you ever listen to Against Me? Yeah. Well, Remember, I mean, not you, recently, but back in the day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but they put out a bunch of EPs Originally, then they did Reinventing Axl Rose, where they redid all the songs from those old EPs. And obviously, diehard fans like me and everyone else always preferred the EPs, which I'm sure the majority of the audience will always prefer, you know, Sick Pup and, and Life's a Dog on Shame, if that's how they came into the fold right. of this music. Um, I obviously do not prefer them, but, uh, you <laughs> know, we were thinking about bringing back... Uh, Terrible and True, September Doves, and redoing them in a different production style. Right. And you and, had mentioned that to me at some point. Yeah. And that's why I was... Just breathing life back into them. Right. But, um... And then some songs just came. The perfect ones. I actually, I, I wrote uh, what I believe is the greatest song that I ever wrote. Is the last track and the title track on the Lost Dog record, it's called Survived. And I wrote it, and it's the first song. So I wrote it, didn't really think anything of it. Came the next day, it was like 11 o'clock at night, I was in my garage, chain smoking, like I usually do, winding down <laughs> in the evening. Just, just sitting there, just... Thinking and smoking. Yeah, and uh, I, I record songs a lot, you know, I do little demos. I'll record a song, demo, as five minutes after I wrote it. And sometimes I'll forget I wrote it, but this one particularly the day after, I went back to it and I, and I pushed play and I started crying, I remember. And it was, it wasn't, I wasn't sad. It was a grateful cry. I was grateful that I had been given this gift that so few people have as an outlet for their anger and their depression and their frustration in life. And the entire culmination of the song is kind of about my own personal redemption through the hell that that I have put myself through and, and been put through. And it all just kind of came all at once. It was like this, the song's about this redemption and it's cyclical being able to do that and write that is redemptive and the product is redemptive okay and that's so rare it's not it's not only that the process of doing it releases it the aftermath helps guide you back to the redemption it's uh but that was one of the most powerful moments uh, of my writing career, um, just like, thank you. Thank you for, for all that I am. Thank you for giving me this life. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm so... You felt all that coming together from that, just that song. Yep, and that was the last song. I needed, I needed a song 
I needed a waltz to finish out the album and I needed a minor waltz. I needed one of the kind of those iconic Lost Dog minor tunes, uh, like Can't Get Away From Yourself uh, mm -hmm. until I recoup. Um, and that's kind of an iconic trend in, uh, in the Lost Dog legacy, you know, are, the, are, are those minor waltzes, those, those deep, dark cuts right. of, of personal reflection. But yeah, I needed that and it just kind of manifested. And yeah, and then after, after crying and everything, I came <laughs> to and I was like, went upstairs to Ashley and she, you know, wakes up a little bit. I'm like, I think I just, <laughs> I think I just wrote the best song I've ever written and I don't know if I can beat it. Dude, yeah. that yeah. is huge. <laughs> but man. now I'm scared, man. <laughs> I don't Good know if I luck. Can beat it. I don't know if I can beat it, man. Ah. Oh. You can always try, and that would that's good enough just to yeah. try. <laughs> but uh, my, I was in such a stagnant place with music for so long, and uh, a big part of that is a my my physical ailments have been really trapping me on stage and off stage creatively. Um, I've just come to a point where I have to have a drummer. I cannot physically take on the responsibility of filling the sound uh, of a string band guitarist any longer. Um, I don't know how he ran it this long. Um, I also don't know why people have kept going to shows. I, I, I listen to... A, <laughs> I ran into, you know, pe people upload music and shows all the time and it's it's damn near impossible to keep up with it and, and get it pulled down. Ran into something the other day someone put on a podcast from a show like five years ago and uh, listened to it and I was like, well, that's about the same set list that we played last year, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, why the fuck do people keep coming here and supporting this? Well... I mean, for me, I've been to probably 10 of your shows, so I'm one of those type of people. And I think there's, a, there's enough time in between. You know, you'll, you'll tour long enough, you'll be gone a year before you swing back through, and they'll be ready to hear them songs again because they're not just songs you hear on the radio and they're flashing a pan and the next artist is on. The, a lot of the songs that you write stick around. That's why you have a cult following. I really believe that. Like you have diehard fans. The Lost Dog fans are some of the best. Like they're there for you all the time. It is. It is an incredible place to be as as someone creating the art, um, knowing that I have a sea of people who are going to buy and support um, whatever I put out. Initially, anyway. Yeah. They may regurgitate it back and be like, okay, we didn't enjoy that. <laughs> but uh, but th they'll be there at, at the onset. A part of it with Lost Dog, like I was talking about, is that it's, it is really hard to relate with things that I wrote uh, in the darkest points of my life. And I think that that was weighing on my spirit a lot. Um, there's a lot of the content. We have kind of staple songs, you know or things that at least I consider need to be played uh, at shows generally, you know, uh, September Doves, Terrible and True, Using Again, um, Sorry for the Things. I don't know how long the list to some people might be. Um, but a, a big part of that stagnation and that feeling is not being able to stomach playing those things consistently as much anymore and with writing both these albums and having 20 new songs uh, I'm really excited to come back and be able to put uh, and be able to change the majority of the set um, and I'm very curious how the audience will react um, I'm sure that there will be 
some people who, who don't appreciate it. Um, but I'm like you said, I'm hoping it also opens up uh, a whole new door and avenue for people to be able to uh, appreciate what I do. Um, because, you know, the Honky Tonk album specifically is done in such a, a classic fashion of production. Like I said before, each song, the entire record, the concept is uh, a different production era for every track. So it, it begins in about the, the mid 50s, uh, kind of Ray Price, and ends in more mid 90s, kind of Alan Jackson. Um, and spans, I mean, obviously you can't possibly <laughs> span every artist's different style of production, but it's more of a taste of, uh, you know, what I enjoy out of the history of country music. And uh, I don't know, I, I, I've actually been thinking about uh, running a, uh, some type of, I don't know, kind of like an NCAA bracket, but with... <laughs> <laughs> with the song like if someone can guess correctly like it doesn't have to be precise you know basically for every song i have uh i gave andre a, a production reference like you know it's this era it's more you know it's randy travis's more western swing style stuff from the mid 80s uh here's a song reference if someone can kind of vaguely name all of them uh, I'm thinking about running some type of contest. <laughs> That'd be fun. Yeah. For people who listen to that music and, and enjoy the album, uh, someone will get it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know? there's, a, there's some wizard out so, there. Yeah, some nerd. <laughs> some fucking nerd. So what about, uh, uh, as far as the, the um, Honky Tonk album, what kind of instruments are we talking? What's all in this? You know, we know what you've, used over the you know past with lost dog stuff and brought in different players is there anything that hasn't been certain instrument wise um there's electric bass uh on most of it pedal steel there is a uh, orchestral stacked uh fiddle kind of like uh nashville sound style on parts of it um, there's piano, there's honky tonk piano, there's all, like straight, like just wild, rowdy honky tonk piano. <laughs> there's also really, really sweet kind of George Jones or Merle Haggard, um, love song piano. Um, I'm trying, oh, there's, there's an accordion on one song. Oh, okay. For the, uh for the 90s country tune. Um, so you just gave one of the answers away, God dude. Damn you, it. I gave like four of the answers away. <laughs> Fuck me. All right. We can't we can't uh, There's your hint. So if you watch the show, this. you got you're in the you get the bonuses there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to stop talking. You just talk from here on out. <laughs> Man. Yeah, I can't wait. That's going to be exciting. I can't wait to when we're done with this, you got to show me those tracks. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. No, but it is, it, it's funny because there are so many, we were just talking before the interview, there, there are so many secret plans that I, ha- I do have to be careful in general with <laughs> what I say and how I say it. Um, but th- those albums are being uh, pitched to labels right now. Um, there are some bigger labels involved in those conversations. I don't know how it's going to shake out. Um, I know that the public is very, very hungry. Uh, it's early July when this is being taped. Um, it's been very hard to sit and be patient and play the game. But at the onset of this, I kind of decided uh, I'm at a place in my career. I'm financially comfortable. Um, I have built a legacy with my music. Um, that that I, that I could, you know, that I, I, I could leave this industry now and start a logging company and, and be comfortable. That my name is is 
in conversations and I've, I've made a mark on this world. Um, but it's time for me to uh, work, try to work within the system a little more than I ever have. It's time to uh, give my music the opportunity to breathe. And I think that I have been the biggest inhibitor of my own success over the years. And, uh, you know, coming to that realization is important too. Just that I have stopped most of the opportunities. And a part of that's good paranoid thinking. <laughs> a part of that's good preservation uh, I do not want to be eaten by the machine, and I have, you know, we're in the Americana boom. There are a million artists from all over the country popping up constantly. It is, it is a gold rush right now. It is, it, it's hard for me to keep up with. Yeah. There are, there are, you know, 300 new names every few months just coming up. Uh, you said 10 tracks on the Honky Tonk. Did, is it going to be 10 on the Lost Dog, too? Did you say that? I'm a 10-track man. I, I'm starting to figure that out with you. All day. You think it's the perfect it setup? It is. It's the perfect setup. And you're saying it has the best song you've ever written on it? The Lost Dog record has, in my opinion, the best song that I've ever written, which is Survived. I don't know how long people are going to be able to wait for this. <laughs> Now if that gets out, everyone's going to be, and we, when we obviously we don't have any sort of idea of a release date because, like you said, you're still pitching the album. I, and all I that. don't even have an idea of the release date. I can tell you, uh, I guess a spoiler would be. I hope this comes to fruition and there are no problems. Um, but August third should be the first release of music. Um, we're releasing uh, a music video with Western as Fuck again. Uh, Mike, who has become an incredibly close friend of mine, uh, love him to death. Incredible guy. Um, we shot a video in Wyoming in an old abandoned warehouse. I, can't, I think it was a concrete facility. Um, but it's a uh, lifetime of work is the song and uh, it's a it's a nice waltz kind of a ballad um, just about the the love embedded within labor as, as kind of your expression of love mm -hmm. like, the, like the work that uh, we do you brought up you know as far as a live performance and bringing on a drummer there's a drummer on both records. Um, the Lost Dog record, I think the production, what, what stands out probably the most, there's, there's more mandolin on this record than I've ever put on anything. Um, and I, I had more of a hand in the production of the Lost Dog record. And me, me and Andrea, who has also become an incredible friend of mine, uh, we had it out a little bit about production. Um, just because when you, Lost Dog has a, has a long history and there's a certain expectation of the production. Like it would be weird to throw out of left field something on a Lost Dog record. And I remember uh, one, the first song on the record, um, we kind of uh, went back and forth on. He wanted to put a, a, a 12 string electric guitar on it. <laughs> and uh, it just, it never hit with me. And I put it off, I think to the second to last day of production. And I, and I, I finally, I was like, Andrea, we cannot keep it. And it's like, this band has its own kind of legacy we cannot just shock the public. And I genuinely, and a part of it, I genuinely didn't like it. Yeah. Which, when you're working with a producer, uh, there is some of that. And there, there are some things on the Honky Tonk record I didn't like at first. And then uh, as time went on, I was like, that was such a good idea. 
<clears throat> and thank goodness I didn't let my ego get the best of me because right. the, it, it, it made the song, you know. Um, but uh, beyond that, it's, it's pretty... I'd say this record, Lost Dog record, really harkens back to the formula of old Lost Dog more than probably the last two albums. All right, well, we've covered quite a bit about what's to come with the records. So the next thing everyone's going to want to know is when you're going to hit the road again. You've been on hiatus for a little bit, taking a little break, which is much needed sometimes for people, obviously. Uh, you guys have been doing it for a long time. But what have you been doing with this break? Obviously, you made two records, so you didn't really take too much time off. You were still working. No, I didn't. And really, the last three weeks are the first time that I've felt uh, at all at peace in a certain sense uh, in, in my adult life. And it's just been a very, very fragile time for me. Um, I felt very, very lost in my direction and purpose. Um, I felt like there's been a hole in my life. And yeah, I mean, obviously a part of that is not having the engagement with the public. Um, but it's something deeper as well. And... Um, I don't really know when to get back on the road because a hard part about it is I really don't want to come back on the road and present new material that's not released. Um, a lot of artists do that. A lot of artists yeah. are fine with just like literally doing an entire album uh, of unreleased material on the road or, you know, playing, playing multiple tunes that the public doesn't know about. Um, I've always had the philosophy, give the public what they want. I have been doing a ton of projects, working with heavy equipment. Uh, I've been working a lot on my mental health. I've, I've taken, I've been fasting a lot, been getting into shape, uh, getting my mind into shape, um, really working on my patience, working on my mental stability um, working on being a better husband, a better brother, a better son, uh, a better community member, um, which is something that you really miss out on in that grind, um, when you get caught up in just this machine and it's, it's hard to watch from the outside because there's something kind of perverse and idolatrous about this entire industry that's hard to stomach sometimes it's it and it's it's also hard to stomach when I'm when I'm from the outside watching other people do this and I'm like I do this yeah or I've done this and just thinking about how complicated and fragile and and precious life is and how much time is spent as individuals in the frame of being an artist just building our own egos and legacy. And it is hard to stomach. And and a part of me doesn't want to go back to it and, and like in the, in the wholesome aspect that, that I, I've built in my life now, the real rich goodness, the deep, sacred, ancient wisdom and beauty that is actually in the world. And then all of these, these egos and uh, all of this self-promotion being the complete polar opposite, complete shallow, fucking idiotic, worthless, meaningless nonsense that's just an entertaining distraction. 
And obviously, I, I have tried to build my career to be the antithesis of that, um, to be something rich and be something that people can uh, confide within themselves with, because uh, that's what it is for me. My own music is that for me as well. I can listen to an old song and, and really dig and reflect who I am and what I want to be, uh, which is the perfect yin and yang of, of uh, healthy motivation. You don't, not only are you looking toward the direction that you want to go in life, but you also need the demon in life from your past to run away from at the same time. Uh, you need both of those things. You need to be able to look back and be like, I'm not going back there. That's, that's not me anymore. And you also need, uh, you also need that inspiration to guide you forward and where you want to go. Um, but it's been very, very revealing and I'm still kind of working through it. Um, and, and if you're just in the grind all the time, uh, you can't do that self-reflection. And I'm very blessed and lucky to be who I am and be able to do that. Because most people, it's like, most people can't stop their life and be like, whoa, what am I doing? Where do I want to go? And who don't I want to be behind me? So I'm, I'm very lucky in that and thankful that I get to do this that I even get the opportunity to, to step back and, and consider who I am. Yeah. I mean, hell, I mean, that's about, by you guys taking a break, that's about the best thing you can do with your time. You know, self-reflection and getting out and the mental health part of it, just keeping your mind sharp is half the battle these days with people, you know? Yeah. Myself I, included. <laughs> I, the biggest part of it that I've realized is anytime I start like fomenting and getting stressed, I realize which is a, it, which is a, a piece of Buddhist wisdom or Taoist wisdom. Um, anytime you're suffering, it is a result of attachment. Uh, so this entire time off has, has been a constant, like, oh, I feel extreme anxiety. Why do I feel that way? Okay, it's because I'm attached to this idea. Um, and then I force myself to grieve the death of that idea. And then I can make a good objective decision about it. But you can't make a good objective decision if you're emotionally attached to the outcome. You cannot make a good decision about it. So, and that's been the pro, I mean, every part of my career, every part of my personal life, I've had to go through and individually mourn, and I'm still in the process of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, a big part of that is also letting uh, my attachment to what the public wants of me in my career letting that go, letting my own career die in my own, in my own mind to be able to rebuild the way that I want. And that's really hard. Letting your own identity die and be, and be like, you need, you need to be who you should be in the world. And that's another uh, truth that I, I try to tell people constantly. Um, people are like, I just, I don't know what I want to do. It's like, well, that's the wrong question. It doesn't matter what you want. What you want is really fickle and, and, and stupid and useless. Who gives a shit what you want? <laughs> do what you should do. Figure out what you need to be in this world and, and go from there. Um, and deciding that without an attachment to uh, what the public wants or, well, really, yeah, what the public wants, deciding what I need to be in this world to 
be effective as a leader and as a man and as a husband. Uh, that's the struggle. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's heavy when you <laughs> go down that rabbit hole. And like you said, what you want to do is probably not a good thing. <laughs> no. <laughs> All of us want to do stuff, and it's probably not good. I want to do heroin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. You know, but uh, that is the absolute last thing that I, or basically anyone who's uh, not on their deathbed should do. So with all this time, which it, it, it really hasn't been that long in the grand scheme of things, but it feels like it. Everything is compounded because of how fast the industry is now moving. Right. That's a big part of it. It's like the industry has been moving and, and it's changed in such a drastic way with the quantity of output of certain artists, which sets a standard in the public's mind. It's like you have people uh, like Zach Bryan, who is putting out fucking tomes, 60, 80 songs a year. It's like, how the fuck am I supposed to keep up with that <laughs> and live a decent, good, wholesome life? Who can do that? Charlie Crockett, motherfuckers. Those two are. <laughs> you guys got a gotta factory, stop, man. They're a factory. You're of killing us. <laughs> no, I'm 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 happy that they can do that. Um, I cannot, but it it certainly does. You know, every time I post something now, people are like, like, and it gets a little rude sometimes. A couple of people push it a little too far. Like some people be like, new music, stop saying things, <laughs> or like, what? We don't care. Where's the new music? <laughs> like I'm like, bro. People say that. Oh yeah. Oh, oh, come happened. on, man. Well, whatever. Well, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, it's tough. It's a it's a, we it's a weird time Yeah. with all this. It's uh, a weird combination of everything with uh, the absolute diarrhea explosion dump of information constantly online from, uh, from contemporaries uh, of mine. Which I'm not. I'm not trying to to bag on them, um, but I but I will say some of y'all should reflect on your personal life a little more. Sorry, <laughs> like, <laughs> I've, I've said it. Get the fuck off the phone. Pay attention to your family. Think about who you are in reference to your actions and what type of person you want to be in this world instead of, you know posting uh, a photo of a, a raccoon and a tutu or whatever the <laughs> fuck you do. Calm down. I'm just being a grumpy old man. <laughs> so do you have a projected time, a possible time to be back out there? Or is it really just all in the hands of when this record will actually come out? Or both records? That's what it seems like it's going to be right now, which I'm hoping for spring of next year. 2024 um, we are looking at some dates later this year I don't know if they will happen um, stay tuned now when you do go back on the road you got two different things going on honky tonk lost dog then you got your solo stuff which you work in to the set already are you going to try and work in the honky-tonk stuff in the midst of a Lost Dog set? Are you going to... How does that work? We're kind of formulating that. Are we... Again, I... <laughs> <laughs> am formulating that uh, in my own mind. But I believe what will happen is... A, is kind of, kind of what you said. I believe I will turn it into one encompassing show because the alternative to that would get kind of hairy because you've got Benjamin Todd, but you've got Benjamin Todd with a honky tonk record and uh, you've also got 
30 songs and three albums of Benjamin Todd in an extremely different light. Mm -hmm. uh, the majority of which I, I couldn't possibly play and stay sane. Uh, and then you have a decade, over a decade of Lost Dog. So I don't know what the alternative would be. If I, if I ran Lost Dog and Benjamin Todd, which would be great for money, I could tour uh, every market twice in the same year. Uh, but then what am I going to do? Am I going to do my honky-tonk stuff with my solo stuff? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how that works. Right. So it'll probably be all one encompassing show. Maybe it will be billed as uh, Benjamin Todd and Lost Dog Street Band. Kind of like, you know, Tyler Childers and the Food Stamps. Um, maybe it will turn into something like that. But I think the general branding will remain the same. Like we'll release albums as Lost Dog and we'll release albums. We. I will release albums. <laughs> <laughs> I got a mouse in my pocket. Um, well, I guess me and Henry. Henry, come here. You gonna help me? You gonna help me figure stuff out? You're not even in the shot. <laughs> this is going south. <laughs> no, I think that works, man. I, I think that would be the the way to go. Because uh, that would really change it up too, as far as. A live set would go. There'd be a nice variety just around that one act. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. that'd be be a good show. But yeah, we're uh, consideration is going at this point to having five people on stage. But you know, I've also been grappling with the logistics of of touring too. You got five people. All right. Well, now you definitely need a TM. You need an actual tour bus, full scale. Um, you need a sound guy. You need someone to vaguely run as a stage tech. Um, even if it's the manager having some, uh, or sound guy, or yeah, the manager or sound guy having some uh, technical understanding of instruments and the needs of instruments and the strings and how to operate everything. Yeah. So, you know, okay, well, now you're talking about, you know, eight people going around the country. How the hell do you make that work? So that's where now uh, I've got management, Jesse Schuster and uh, Space Colonel um, helping out with all that, which has been a huge relief uh, for me psychologically. Um, Jesse was my booking agent for years. Sorry, I'm getting eat up by mosquitoes. <laughs> um, he's been my booking agent from, he was my first booking agent and we had it out a little bit and I moved for a while and then came back and now he's moved into a management position and, uh, he's thriving and I'm, I'm proud of him and, uh, he is, you know, he's my man. So that's great. He, he's uh, he's the guy I trust for the next step in this. Okay. Good deal. Well, man, I appreciate you stopping by and filling this all in, really, about what's going on, because I know a lot of people are asking, and. Uh, yeah, we made this too long again, though. So. <laughs> Quit talking. <laughs> oh, Fine, shit. I'm not saying another fucking word. Any, any final words we should say before we cut out? Stay tuned. Uh, I'm coming back with a vengeance. Bam. We did it again. <laughs>